I particularly love that song because it's talking about our identity. I'm yours. Who, who am I? Vapor in the wind, but I'm, I'm who God says that I am. We hope that you discover who God says you are. It's my privilege to talk to you about somebody who someone else is, our special guest speaker uh, for tonight and for this whole weekend. We're thrilled to have Dr. Christopher Yuan with us. He's a professor of the Bible at Moody Bible Institute for over a decade, speaks all over at colleges, universities, uh, conferences, churches like ours. I was just talking to him before this. He says he, pretty much every weekend except for the holidays, he's somewhere communicating the message God has given him. And so we're thrilled that he's made time to be here with us. He's co-author of a book called Out of a Far Country with his mother, Angela. A Gay Son's Journey to God and a Broken Mother's Search for Hope. He's also author of Giving a Voice to the Voiceless, which was his dissertation. I haven't, it's the one book of his I haven't read, but I will. And then, of course, his newest book, which I highly recommend, and both, all of these are available, by the way, in a resource table in the back tonight as you leave, Holy Sexuality in the Gospel, Sex, Desire, and Relationships Shaped by God's Grand Story. He's joined by his father, Dr. Leon Yuan, and by his mother tomorrow. When, and if, I encourage you to come back tomorrow because he'll be here. It'll be a different message, and you'll want to hear both if you have the time to do that. On a personal note, I just want to say that in our culture right now, you'll find Christians that are holding fast to the truth, but they lack compassion. And you find Christians in this conversation who are deeply compassionate, but they're losing their grip on the truth. And Dr. Yuan's voice is one of the few that's graciously doing both. And so will you join me in welcoming Dr. Christopher Yuan? Thank you. Thank you. We live in a world of infinite shades of gray, not just 50. In the name of tolerance, relativism and moral ambiguity has become a virtue. Sexual freedom that we hear celebrated on television, in media, in our schools, sexual freedom has almost become the religion of the land. And this is the deception of our day that your sexual desires define you, determine you, and should always delight you. And yet since the fall of Adam Adam and Eve, the human heart has set itself in defiance against God's perfect ways. And yet, the good news is that this idolatry of sexual freedom and sexual identity is on a collision course with the gospel, as my life was on a collision course with the gospel. Tomorrow morning in the services, I'm going to share my uh, testimony with my parents, my mother and my father, so we're going to share that. But I wanted to just give you kind of a snippet so you have a little bit of an idea of where I'm coming from. So I wasn't raised in a Christian home. My parents raised me with very traditional Chinese values, obey your parents, do well in school, and practice piano. (laughs) Not as good as you, though. (laughs) But uh, I wrestled with my sexuality from a very young age, and um, it wasn't until I, it was in my, it wasn't until I kind of, yeah, I know, so cute. It was all downhill from there. (laughs) So I wrestled with my sexuality, but I kept my feelings hidden through high school, college, even the Marine Corps Reserves. In my early 20s, I no longer kept it a secret, and I came out of the closet. I was going to dental school in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm from the Chicago area in the southwest suburbs. I came out of the closet, and I broke the news to my parents, and I told them, I am gay. Devastated my parents. So I decided to go home and break the news to my parents, and I told them, I am gay. My mom gave me an ultimatum, to choose a family or choose choose that. Well, for me, this was not a choice, so I left home. Well, the timing couldn't have been any worse, but through that crisis, my mother came to faith, and then my father. Well, I went in the opposite direction, and I wanted nothing to do with their Christianity. I spent most of my free time in the gay clubs, and I went from relationship to relationship seeking intimacy and happiness, which I found, but it still left me feeling unfulfilled and unsatisfied. So I began experimenting with drugs. Now, to be clear, not all gays and lesbians do drugs. Not all gay men are promiscuous. Unfortunately, that is part of my story. But I started doing drugs. I started selling drugs. 
I sold to friends, classmates, even a professor. You see, I actually thought I could live this double life of being a graduate student by day and a promiscuous drug dealer by night. But three months before I was to receive my doctorate, the administration expelled me. So my parents flew from Chicago to Louisville, and I thought they were going to fight to keep me in school. But to my surprise, my mother told the dean, it's not important that Christopher becomes a dentist. What's more important is that Christopher becomes a Christ follower. And she said that they're going to support whatever decision the school made. Well, I was not very happy about my mom's decision. So I moved further away from them to the bright lights in big city of Atlanta, Georgia. And there I quickly took over the drug scene in the gay community and I became a supplier to other dealers in over a dozen states. In addition, it was nothing for me to have multiple anonymous sexual encounters each and every day. Because according to the world, I had it all. Money, fame, drugs, and sex. I had exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and I began worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator, because in my world, I had become God. My parents had no clue that I was doing drugs, but they knew my biggest need was to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, so they tried to reach out to me with the love of Christ, and I wanted nothing to do with it. They came to visit me one time in Atlanta, and I told them to get out. Before my dad left, he wanted to give me something, and it was his very first Bible. And I told my dad, I don't want your Bible. But he kept, left it on my kitchen counter anyway and walked out the door. And as soon as they left, I took my dad's Bible, and I threw it in the trash can. I wanted nothing to do with God, and certainly nothing to do with the Bible. And after that visit, it was more than obvious to my parents that I was totally unreachable and completely hopeless. But my parents committed not to focus on the hopelessness, but upon the promises of God. And along with over 100 prayer warriors from their church, from their Bible study fellowship group, they began to cry out to God for me. My mother began to pray a bold prayer. God do whatever it takes to bring this prodigal son to you. In her desperation, she fasted every Monday for seven years and once fasted 39 days on my behalf. She would spend hours every morning in her prayer closet, on her knees, reading the Bible, crying out to God, she knew that it was going to take nothing short of a miracle. And a miracle is exactly what God did. This miracle came with a bang on my door. I opened up my door, and on my front doorstep were 12 federal drug enforcement agents, Atlanta police, and two big German shepherd dogs. I just received a large shipment of drugs, not my largest, but they confiscated all my money and my drugs, and I was charged with the equivalent of 9.1 tons of marijuana. With that amount, I was facing 10 years to life in federal prison. I had started with a bright future among society's finest in academia, and I found myself in the ditch among society's despised in the Atlanta City Detention Center. So I tried calling home, dreading making that phone call just imagining the earful that I was going to get on the other line. But my mother's first words were, are you okay? No condemnation, just words of unconditional love and grace. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Notice Paul isn't saying that it's God's anger. It's not God's wrath, but it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And even on that miserable day, God was pouring out his grace and drawing me to himself through the words of my mother. Actually, my mom was excited to get that phone call, if you're going to believe it or not, because <laughs> I hadn't called home in years 
And she knew without a doubt that this was God's answer to her prayers. So she hung up that phone, fighting back the tears. She knew she had to do like that good old hymn says. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. No matter what storm she was going through, she had to count her blessings. So she set the phone down, and next to the phone happened to be a calculator. And she tore off a little piece of the adding machine tape from the calculator and wrote down these first blessings. Christopher is, is in a safe place <laughs> compared to before. And he called home for the very first time. As my years in prison passed, she kept adding to this list and counting her blessings. And this list of blessings is longer and taller than she is, both sides. Three days later, I was walking around the cell block and I passed by this garbage can and I thought, this is my life. I'm from upper middle class suburb of Chicago. My father has two doctorates. I was only three months away from receiving my own doctorate. I had it made. But now I found myself among common criminals. Trash. With my head down, I was about to pass by this garbage can, but something on top of the trash caught my eye. I bent over, I picked it up, and it was a Gideon's New Testament. I took that New Testament back to my cell. I opened up that good book. For the first time, I read through the entire gospel of Mark that night. But I wasn't thinking oh, this is the answer to my problems. Actually, I simply thought that I've got an enormous amount of time on my hands and a better pass it somehow. But as you know, what we have in our Bibles is not just ink on paper, but what we have is the very breath of God, and it is living and powerful and sharper than any double-edged sword, able to cut through the hardest of hearts, exposing my sin, my rebellion, and it wasn't a pretty sight, and I thought things couldn't get any worse. I was wrong. A couple weeks later, I was called into the nurse's office. I was handcuffed. She sat me down, and I knew something wasn't right. She wrote something on a piece of paper, slid it across the desk to me. I looked down. And I saw three letters and a symbol. It read H I V positive. The days after were dark and lonely. I was sentenced to six years, much better than 10 years to life that I was facing. But news of my HIV status felt like a death sentence. One night I was laying in my bed and I looked up at the metal bunk above me. Someone had scribbled something and it read, if you're bored, read Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. You see, at the most hopeless point in my life, the Lord God was using the words penned by a prophet thousands of years ago to a rebellious nation, Israel, to tell me that he still had a plan for me. I had no clue where that plan was going to take me, but God gave me enough faith, enough strength to get through that one day and the next and the next. My transformation was gradual. God was convicting me of my dependencies, obviously drugs, but within a few months, God delivered me from that addiction. God kept bringing in mind other idols, and there was one that I felt like I just couldn't let go of, my sexuality. So I went to a chaplain, and I asked him his opinion on this, and to my surprise, he actually told me the Bible doesn't condemn homosexuality, and he even gave me a book. So with much curiosity, I took that book in the hopes of finding biblical justification for homosexuality. I had that book in one hand and the Bible in the other. And can I just tell you, from a purely human perspective, I had every reason in the world to accept what that book is claiming to justify the way I had been living. 
but God's indwelling Holy Spirit convicted me that those assertions from that book were a clear distortion of God, his word, and his unmistakable condemnations against same-sex relationships. I couldn't even finish that book, and I gave it back to the chaplain, which meant I turned to the Bible alone. And I went through every verse, every chapter, every page of scripture looking for justification. I wanted to find any type of a positive affirmation for a monogamous same-sex relationship. I went cover to cover several times. I had time. I looked and I looked and I couldn't find any. So I was at a turning point and a decision had to be made. Either abandon God in his word, live as a gay man, pursue a monogamous same-sex relationship by allowing my attractions, get this, by allowing my sexual attractions to dictate not only who I was, but also how I lived. Or abandon pursuing a monogamous same-sex relationship by freeing, myself, by freeing myself from my sexuality and live as a follower of Jesus Christ. My decision was clear and obvious. I followed Jesus. As the days and the weeks and the months of abstinence passed, I learned that my sexuality should not be the core of who I am. I told myself before, God loves me unconditionally, and that's true. But don't we as sinners like to add to God's truth? I add it so therefore he doesn't want me to change. Similar to your friends who say, God loves me just the way I am, so leave me alone. But after reading the Bible, I learned that unconditional love is not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. You see, my identity shouldn't be defined by my sexuality. My identity shouldn't be grounded in my sexual desires. My identity is not gay, is not ex-gay, is not even heterosexual for that matter. Because my identity as a child of the living God must be in Jesus Christ alone. God says, be holy, for I am holy. I thought that if I were to become a Christian, that I would have to become a heterosexual, which means the more sexually attracted I were to lots of women, the more of a Christian man I would be. But I realized that even if I had opposite sex attractions, I would still need to flee temptation. I would still need to resist sin. So actually, heterosexuality is not the main goal. Besides, God does not command us, be heterosexual for I am heterosexual. But neither did God say, be homosexual for I am homosexual. Rather, God said, be holy for I am holy. So therefore, the opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality, that's not the goal, but the opposite of homosexuality is holiness. As a matter of fact, the opposite of every sin struggle is holiness. I don't need to focus upon whether I'm struggling or tempted, but I need to focus upon living a life of holiness and living a life of purity, because change is not the absence of temptations, but change is the spirit-wrought ability to be holy, even in the midst of temptations. Because the ultimate issue is not whether I'm struggling, not whether I'm tempted, but the ultimate issue is that I yearn after God in total surrender and complete obedience. As I began to live this life of surrender and obedience, God began to reveal his plan for my life. And he called me to full-time vocational ministry while I was in prison of all places. And I realized that um, if I was going to go into ministry that I would have to learn more about the Bible. So I called home, collected my parents, and I asked them to mail me an, an application to the only Bible college I had ever heard of at that time called Moody Bible Institute. But then there was silence on the other line because I think they both dropped their phones. <laughs> they mailed the application into me to prison. I was so excited when I got it, filled it out until I got to the last page where I realized I needed references. Not from anybody, but these had to be people who knew me as a Christian for at least one year. Do the math. I had some slim pickings in prison. <laughs> but I was able to persuade a prison chaplain, a prison guard, and another prison inmate to write my reference to Moody. So amazingly, Moody actually accepted me. I was relieved from prison in July of 2001, started the very next month in August of 2001. So imagine the surprise of my classmates when I answered their question, what did you do this summer? <laughs> 
graduated from Moody in 2005, went after my master's in exegesis from Wheaton College Graduate School, received my doctorate of ministry from Bethel Seminary in St. Paul. And then in 2011, I had the incredible honor of co-authoring a book with my mother called Out of a Far Country, A Gay Son's Journey to God, A Broken Mother's Search for Hope. It's now in seven different languages, including Spanish, Chinese, Korean. And we found out that this book is now being used as a textbook at Christian high schools. Who would have thought? But actually it makes sense. Our youth are being flooded, inundated with resources. They hear stories all the time from the world, from those who are uh, embracing their sexuality in a way that is contrary to the will of God, and we have so few resources to give them, and hear stories that they hear of. So people are using it, families are using it to talk about it at home. My newest book, though, uh, called is Holy Sexuality and the Gospel, Sex, Desire, and Relationships Shaped by God's Grand Story. Because oftentimes we hear the messages about sexuality, biblical sexuality, to be don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. And those are important messages. But you know, you can't build a Christian life on God's no. So what is God's yes? Holy sexuality is quite simply chastity and singleness and faithfulness in marriage, which I'll talk about in just a moment. And that is good news for all. But how do we do a better job at engaging on this topic? How do we uh, minister to our loved ones and friends in the gay community? If we're honest, we realize that we're actually doing quite a poor job. We have a bad reputation. When it comes to being a Christian, we seem quite unchristian, according to this book written by David Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons. They asked young Americans, what do you think about Christians? And what they found was quite surprising. From the bottom, we're viewed to be confusing, not accepting, boring, insensitive, out of touch, too political, old-fashioned, hypocritical, judgmental, and guess what's at the very top? Anti-homosexual. And note what it doesn't say. It doesn't say anti-homosexuality. It says anti-homosexual. So we are viewed to be against gay people. And that is wrong. The gospel is not against anyone. It's for everyone. To put your faith in Christ, by grace through faith in Christ, and because of that faith, go and sin no more. So it's for everyone, and so should we be for everyone. So how can we have a more Christian, gospel-centered response? Well, four things. And if you like my notes, you can scan this QR code um, and get my notes. I'm gonna, we're going to kind of go quite fast through this. So if you're trying to write this down, I don't know if you'll be able to write this down. And I'm going to feel bad if I'm going really fast. So scan this QR code. You'll be asked to sign up for Dropbox. You can just X out of that or say no thank you. Uh, if you don't know what a QR code is, that's okay. <laughs> you can just jot down this shortened URL there and get the same thing. So I'm going to center my talk around four things. The first has to do with our attitude, that we need to be convicted. Before we're kind of pointing the finger at others, we need to be convicted about our own sin first. When I lived as a gay man for years, I felt Christians were telling me that somehow gays and lesbians deserved a hotter place in hell. That Jesus had to hang on the cross a little bit longer for gays and lesbians. Because this is just the worst of worst sins. It is sin but it's not the worst sin. Be my people who say, but wait, the Bible says it's an abomination. True. But you know what else the Bible says? You know in Proverbs 6, King Solomon writes that pride is an abomination. Dissension is an abomination. So when those people are so prideful and think that their sin is not as bad as others, we should tell them, you're an abomination. But what we need to realize, it is sin. You might have others that say, but I can't help it. I mean, it's all over the place, which I agree with you. It's being shoved down our throats, which yes, that's true. You know, I can't get away from it. It's on television. It's on, you know, Disney even. You find yourself stuck in downtown Chicago in the month of March, Pride Week, and whoa, that's too much. 
makes you feel uncomfortable, maybe even disgusted. And I think that feeling that some might have toward this sin that's not their sin struggle should actually remind themselves that that feeling of disgust that they have is really just a fraction of what God feels when he looks at their own sin and maybe even more. So our sin is just as odious in God's eyes than someone else's sin. Because at the end of the day, I want people to know Jesus and to follow him. But you don't do that through a holier-than-thou attitude, do we? I mean, have you, have, have you met anyone? I mean, has anyone in this room ever come to Christ through someone who, who's really prideful? You know, oh, I came to Jesus. This old lady, she was so pompous. I've never heard that before, right? Have you? It's gentleness, compassion, being, you know, being really transparent about their own struggles, their own sin. That is what draws people. So first and foremost, let us be convicted. Second, let us be consistent in three ways. First of all, regarding relationships. What is your relationship status? Are you married or are you single? And there's such an emphasis upon marriage, which is good, but it's almost to the point where we say marriage is good and singleness is not. You might think, well, what does this have to do with my gay loved one? A lot. Because God is communicating to us clearly that being in a same-sex relationship is not his will. And he's calling us, our hope for our loved one is that they would put their faith in Christ and go and sin no more, which means that they will not be in a same-sex relationship, which means that they will be single for a period in their life, if not for a longer period in their life. And if so, do we have a healthy, thriving place for Christian singles today in Christian community? Not so much. I think we need to realize that oftentimes we equate singleness with loneliness. Actually, that's the world does as well. My gay friends often tell me something like this. They say, what you're saying is your God wants me to be lonely for the rest of my life. And they're equating singleness with loneliness. And well, it's not exactly the same thing. And you know why? Because I actually know some people who are married and they're still miserably lonely. <laughs> so it's not marriage that's a cure to loneliness. You know what's a cure to loneliness? It begins with a relationship with God. That is a cure to loneliness. I think that is getting the way of many people that they think that being single is unfair. Being single means loneliness and, and depression and uh, sadness. That is only marriage that we can be happy. That is going so contrary to the gospel. You realize Jesus Christ did not die so that we could get married. Jesus died so that we would have him. We need to find our contentment, not in another person. The world keeps telling us, and even our flesh tells us, I can only be happy if I'm with someone else. We find our contentment in Christ alone, whether you're married or whether you're single. If you're familiar uh, with the Obergefell decision, June 26, 2015, when the Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage, so when that happened, five individuals changed the course of history. The majority opinion was written by Justice Kennedy, and he wrote something very interesting at the very end, which really revealed the misunderstanding that they had, and that was the premise for why they voted for same-sex marriage and what they call marriage equality. He wrote, marriage is the highest ideal of love. I'll say it again. He wrote, marriage is the highest ideal of love. I disagree. Marriage is not the highest ideal of love. God is. God alone is love. He's not only loving, he is love. It's an ontological reality of our God. And when someone says something different, I'm gonna very respectfully but firmly disagree. And so I wrote something uh, with my good friend, Rosaria Butterfield, and we called it something greater than marriage because here's the truth. Marriage does not have a monopoly on love. So I wrote this, and if you like it, you go out to the uh, tables, and, and um, I think we have some printed out copies if you would like a copy of that. 
But we need to look to what the word of God says about singleness. And in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul spends an entire chapter not only saying that singleness is good, he says that it's a gift, truly a gift. But let me give you some advice for those of you in this room who are not single. Don't keep reminding your Christian single friends that this is a gift. (laughs) Because actually, I know very few singles that like that verse. You know, yay, that's my life verse. No. (laughs) It's usually quite the opposite. Like, I don't understand what Paul is talking about there. And I understand that as a single man. It's not easy. And, you know, it it can be difficult. And, I mean, we can all agree. Everyone says marriage is a gift. Hallelujah. When it comes to singleness, most don't agree that it's a gift. Instead, you know what people say about singleness? It's a calling. (laughs) It's a calling, you know. (laughs) Seriously. Not anyone can be single. You have to be either Superman or Wonder Wonder Woman to be single, which I don't know if you've noticed, but most of the superheroes are single. And their love interest is their weakness. You know, what are we teaching our children? (laughs) No wonder why they're so confused. And the majority of my Christian friends are married. They're even happily married. But they tell me a secret about marriage, that it takes work. Giving of yourselves, loving unconditionally. That's not easy. Paul says in Ephesians 5, Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church by giving himself up for her. So husbands, give up your life as Christ did for the church. Amen, ladies? Amen, wives? You can kind of do this now. (laughs) So you know what I say about marriage? Tongue in cheek. I say marriage. That's a calling. Seriously, right? A calling. (laughs) Singleness is a gift. I don't have to lay my life down for anyone yet. But the big lie that we hear from the world is I cannot be happy as a single person. I can only be happy when I'm married. That those in the gay community say that I have no meaning if I'm not married. I have no purpose in life if I'm not married. I have no value in life if I'm not married. What's wrong about love? People say love is love. Nothing is wrong about love because love does not equal sex. It's the sex that God is concerned about. And note, Yes, we should love one another. The Bible even says, love one another. Love does not equal sex. That doesn't mean that we should just have sex with one another. Love, we should love everyone, but marriage is, for, is very specific, and it's not the same as love. So we need to be consistent regarding marriage and singleness. Because honestly, I don't think we're ready to address this issue until we first redeem singleness. Second, we need to be consistent regarding sexuality. What is God's standard? Because many times people say, you know, if homosexuality is not God's will, then it must be heterosexuality. But let's think about that. Heterosexuality means being attracted to some of the opposite sex, being sexually intimate. That's a broad definition that could be defined as me sleeping with half a dozen women. That's considered heterosexual. I could be cheating on my wife with another woman. That's also considered heterosexual. I could be an unmarried man and I'm living with my girlfriend. That's also considered heterosexual. We even have a few children children together out of wedlock. That's considered heterosexual, but all sinful in God's eyes. God would never say, this is my standard heterosexuality when it includes sinful behavior. You might think, but wait, marriage between a man and a woman is heterosexual. True, it's one form of heterosexual relationship, but not representative of all. So it's too broad We need to be much more specific. If it's not heterosexuality, it's not homosexuality, then what is it that God is calling us to? God is calling us to holy sexuality. And what is holy sexuality? When I read through the full counsel of God, there's only two paths for us to be on. First path, if you're not married and you're single, how do you live faithful to God? By being sexually abstinent. The other path is if you do If you're no longer single and you actually marry, and when I say marry, I'm just using the only definition that we find in the Bible, the only definition that God provides for us, the only definition that Jesus actually Jesus uses in Mark chapter 10 and Matthew 19, where he says, in the beginning, the creator made the male and female, and the two shall become one flesh. There's only one definition for Jesus between man and woman, male and female. So if you are no longer single and you become married by the definition of God, then how do you live? You live faithful to, to your spouse of the opposite sex. 
So quite simply, holy sexuality is chastity in singleness and faithfulness in marriage. Third, we need to be consistent regarding change. What does change look like? Gate is straight? No. Well, what about if someone still has those attractions or temptations? Does that mean that the person hasn't been fully transformed? Well, do we apply that principle to anything else? Say if a friend who was a drunk comes to Christ, stops drinking, but after years of sobriety, he admits he still has those temptations. Would we tell him you haven't been changed? Actually, I think that the manifestation of God's grace is more evident in his life because he says no to his flesh and says yes to God. So change is not the absence of temptations. God never promises you that when you come to Christ, you'll never be tempted again, that somehow he'll just kind of take away all your feelings and attractions and desires. No. Change is not the absence of temptations, but change is the spirit wrought ability to be holy even in the midst of temptations. And this is really important here. Because I think for the longest time, we have diagnosed this incorrectly, not the way that the Bible has diagnosed it. You know how we've diagnosed it? We've treated this more as a disease, as a psychological disorder. And what do I mean by this? We have diagnosed this as more a developmental problem, that something in the past happened and made a person this way. How many of you guys have ever heard something like this? That the root causes, they'll say, the root causes of homosexuality are an absentee father, dominant mother, or abuse in one's childhood. How many of you guys have ever heard something like that before? So why that is problematic to say that is the root causes, certainly those are influences. I mean, parenting and things in our past, especially even abuse, do affect us. But why we cannot say that, that that is the root cause it's contrary to scripture because when we say that our problems, the root of that is from our childhood development, you know what that is? It's Freudian and not biblical. And I think unfortunately, Christians are sometimes more busy following Sigmund Freud than they are Jesus Christ. So if that's not the root cause, then what is it? Scripture just tells us the root cause of our sinful be behavior is not to say that I'm a victim of my past. It's to say the problem for my sinful behavior is rooted in my sin nature. Because when we diagnose it correctly, you know what we can say? Sin is a problem and Jesus is the answer. And this is important because there has been, as a result of this framework and this ideology, there has been innocent bystanders that are victims. And who is that? Parents. If you think about it, I don't know of any other sin issue where we have blamed the children's sin squarely on the shoulders of parents. Have you? I don't know of any of the other ones. And so if you're that parent and you've been blaming yourself, please hear me, hear me. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. Perfect parenting does not guarantee perfect children. Look at Adam and Eve. Didn't they have a perfect father? Yes or no? They did. They didn't have a perfect environment, right? We think, oh, maybe if I had just had the right, you know, everything was perfect in the environment. They were in the Garden of Eden. They still rebelled. What makes you think, mother or father, you can do much better? You know, the primary job of a Christian parent is not actually to produce godly children. That's not your job. In other words, you can't actually do that. The job of a Christian parent is simply to be a godly parent. You can control that. You can do that. You be godly yourself. You pray that your kids would be godly. You pray that they would know Christ. But you cannot take a hardened heart, a dead heart, and make it alive for God. Only God can do that. And let me tell you a secret. Parent, you're not God. You be godly and let God be God. Third, we need to be compassionate. I've been teaching at Moody for over a dozen years. And every semester I get students that confide with me that they're wrestling with their sexuality. And sometimes they've never told anyone. And because of that isolation, sometimes they struggle with depression and even thoughts of suicide. That should move us. 
that we have brothers and sisters in Christ who for whatever reason feel that they can't share this with the rest of us. So how can we be a more safe, compassionate place? First, expect that this is present here. Not be surprised that we have brothers and sisters in Christ who are wrestling with this. You know, I still get people who are so shocked. Like people who find out, like years, some, they've known someone for years, grown up with them. And they say, I don't know how, you know, I don't know how she has same-sex attractions. She came from a good home. She had Christian parents. She was even homeschooled. <laughs> and I want to say, wait one second. Are you really saying that if someone comes from a good home, they have Christian parents and they're homeschooled, that they're somehow exempt from struggling with sin? Is that what you're really saying? Okay, newsflash. I'm sensing in this room, even right now, that there's a good group of us here that I bet there's probably five or six of you, maybe even seven, that's wrestling with sin. <laughs> don't raise your hand. I want to embarrass you. I don't want to have you stick out. <laughs> right, let's, be, let's be really serious. We're all struggling with sin, right? What's the body of Christ? Are we a group of people that got, got it all together, don't have any problems, we got our ducks in a row, we hold hands and we sing kumbaya, is that what we are? Or is the body of Christ a group of people who know we're broken and we need Christ? I'll just be honest with you. I am broken and I need Christ. Anyone else out there that can relate to that at all in any way? And so let us all hand in hand walk together to him, not because I have the answers, not because I can fix you, but I know someone who can. And his name is Jesus. And so let's simply just expect that. Second, know your position. And that's more than don't do it. Like, what's the biggest takeaway? Here's my biggest takeaway. My biggest takeaway is I want people to follow Christ and fully surrender to him. That's my biggest takeaway above everything else. Third, maybe you have a friend or a loved one who you've always wondered whether they're wrestling with this. So you're thinking, how do I ask them? Don't. Instead, give assurance of your friendship and your love for them. Tell them, I thank God for you and I, nothing can change my love for you. When you say that, you've created a safe space and invited them in it. Fourth, let's be a people who say no to the gay jokes and the bullying. You know, we need to be serious and, and say no. There's nothing Christ-like about making fun of others. Amen? Our youth can be really cruel and mean. How about helping our kids expand their vocabulary? You know, what an idea. You know, instead of saying, that's so gay, that, you know, that shirt is so gay, a shirt can't be gay. Like, it's just not possible. <laughs> you know, how about instead of saying, that's so gay, how about that's so Baptist, or that's so Presbyterian, or, you know, something really creative like that, right? I'm sure you can think of something good. <laughs> Fourth, we need to be compa complete. I've been, you know, uh, you know, I've, and this is complete in our message, complete in what we say. We focus upon God's truth because it's a truth that sets us free. So then the question is, what is God's truth? Oh, that's easy, you'll say. It's a sin. Okay, like anything more? No, 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 that's it. It's a sin. When we say nothing more than just it's wrong, it's a sin, you know what that's equivalent to? Giving someone a one spiritual law tract. Remember that? Remember the, remember the four spiritual laws? This is one spiritual law that goes something like this. You're a sinner, you're going to hell, sorry. <laughs> In case you didn't know, there's nothing good about that, is there? That's all bad news, but that's the message we've been giving to the gay community. You're a sinner, you're going to hell, there's no hope for you. It's no wonder why the LGBT community want nothing to do with us because we haven't been giving them the good news. We've been telling the, them the bad news only. We haven't been telling them the complete truth. We have been telling them an incomplete truth. And you know when you tell someone an incomplete truth, that's just as harmful as telling someone a lie. So what is the complete truth? In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he lists 10 sins. In this list of 10 sins are two Greek words right in the middle that focus upon homosexual behavior. Sometimes people look at these verses and say, look, gays and lesbians won't inherit the kingdom of God. When they do that, they conveniently forget about the eight other sins. Because if we look at all 10 sins, none of us should inherit the kingdom of God. Bad news. But I praise the Lord, Paul didn't stop there. He's, he goes on to say in one of my favorite verses in all the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. That actually, my friends, isn't good news. 
That's amazing news. That is news that we can tell anyone who needs to know about Jesus Christ. We have to give them the good news, the hope that you can have in Christ. We need to be redemptive in our message. You know, because our loved ones in the gay community, their main issue is not their sexuality. Their main issue is to fully surrender to Christ. You know, my biggest sin was not being in a same-sex relationship. That was not my biggest sin. You know what was my biggest sin? Unbelief. That is what separated me from God. So how do we be redemptive? And just, I'm going to give you some practical things here, here at the end. And I'm going to focus first on one group, Christians who know that this is not God's will, and yet they have same-sex attraction. Say after this weekend, you actually have a good friend that confides with you. They're wrestling with their sexual identity but they want to follow Christ, what would you say and do? First, thank them. Thank them that they trusted you. Don't freak out, especially parents, don't freak out. Ask open-ended questions. Also, parents, if maybe that's your son or daughter that tells you, you know, obviously say, I love you. And then you know what you don't follow that up with? But. Isn't that funny? A lot of times parents are like, I love you, but. When you say that but, you've just erased everything that you said before. Just say I love you and save the but for later. Second, tell them that they're not alone. You know, a lot of times people think that no one will ever understand them. And you might not exactly know what they're going through, but if you tell them, I want to follow, I want to walk with you to Jesus and follow Jesus together. Those can be life for someone, those words. Third, and this could be one of the most important points here at the end, identity in Christ. You know, I don't know of any other sin issue where we've conflated it to be who we are. Sexuality is not who we are. It's how we are. Since when do we put our sole identity in our attractions, whether they're sexual or romantic or just for relationship? Why do we put, I mean, it doesn't make sense. I don't know of any other thing where we've made our desires, attractions, some that could be sexual, some that could be romantic, just attractions to be who we are. Sexuality is not who we are. It's how we are. So we need to remind each other of that. Fourth, be realistic. Don't give these false promises. Oh, it's so easy when you come to Jesus. You know, no, it's actually harder for me. I did whatever I wanted when I was an unbeliever. Now I have a heavenly father that I want to please, and I have an enemy nipping at my heels. The difference is I have joy that's not bound up in my circumstances. Fifth, don't focus on the externals, how people walk or talk. That's not as important as true heart change. Sixth, we need to encourage and strengthen the relationships and intimacy within the body of Christ. I call this spiritual family. Why is spiritual family much better than spiritual friendship? It's because spiritual friendship, you just focus on each other at the expense and can be at the expense of the body of Christ. We need the body of Christ. What we need more is we need to love each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. It's actually, I think, quite intentional that the Bible doesn't call us that we need to be better friends. It says we need to be better family. So how do we share Christ with those in the gay community? First, this is what you should not do. Do not compare this with an addiction, pedophilia, or murder. Not a good way to win people to Christ, by the way. Second, don't say lifestyle or choice. Christians, we use those words all the time, but I never used those words when I was not a Christian. You know why? I had the wrong identity. See how the wrong identity, wrong thinking, wrong behavior, wrong desires can flow from that. Third, don't say love the sin or hate the sin. Just do it. Fourth, don't feel the need that you have to argue with people all the time. If people ask you a question, you don't always have to answer that question. Look at the example of Jesus. He did not answer every question. Sometimes he was silent. Sometimes he answered a question with another question. Sometimes he gave an answer to another question. So what should you do? Pray and fast. How many of you guys have ever seen the movie War Room? So that movie was written and produced by the Kendrick brothers. Then the Kendrick brothers work with Chris Fabry, part of uh, who's on Moody Radio, to write the book, the novel for The War Room. 
And uh, the book came out around the same time. It was published by Tyndale House. We got a complimentary copy. We opened it, and we saw that the author had dedicated the book to my mom. Do battle for people who are not able to battle for themselves. Second, listen. Don't be quick to speak, but be quick to listen. Third, be intentional. Don't be afraid to invite your neighbor over, your, your gay neighbor over for dinner. And I know you might think, but am I condoning their sin? And that's a good question. But last time I checked, we usually have sinners over for dinner. Nothing new, right? I mean, you're just eating with them. You're not sinning with them. There's a big difference. Fourth, be patient and persistent. It's going to take time for God to turn around a hardened heart. Lastly, be transparent. Share what God is doing in your life lately. Because if you're a follower of Christ, you shouldn't be the same as you were 10 years ago, 10 weeks ago, or even 10 months ago. Talk about that. You know, I would never consider the gospel if I didn't see the gospel lived out in my mother's life and my father's life. I wouldn't have picked up the Bible from the trash. Remember that? If I didn't see the Bible lived out in my parents' lives. I did not leave pursuing same-sex relationships because my parents convinced me they were sinful. No, I left it because they showed me something better. And his name is Jesus. Our job as followers of Christ is to show a dying world out there that no matter what they're clinging to, all the fool's gold in the world, not only is Jesus better, but following Jesus is best. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. God, help us to live lives where it is so apparent that there's nothing better than following you. God, we praise you and we ask this in the beautiful name of your son, Jesus, and the people of God said, amen. I'm sure that wasn't for me walking up here. <laughs> Once again, thank you, Dr. Ewan. Uh, um, I know you flew through uh, that material. It was a great gift to us. So grateful for that. We have a number of questions already submitted. I want to make one clarification. I didn't communicate this very well. It's not a uh, text. It's a website. So if you just type in the URL, sli.do, in case you're wondering how to do this, That'll take you to a website. The code then is you on, and you can submit your questions. But we do have several that have already come. Thank you for your submissions. First question, and uh, this is a really good one, and I, I was not, I'm not surprised to see it here. Do we invite uh, mm. our son's boyfriend into our home and lives? Mm. The question of, well, we'll just take that one as it's written. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be difficult, especially, um, you know, if you're a Christian parent, uh, you raise your child, uh, fearing the Lord, and... Um, Oftentimes, then they've walked away from the faith, or sometimes they're even trying to, mm -hmm. trying to, um, you know, make it match. <laughs> uh, they try to still be Christian, so it, it is really hard, especially for grieving parents. Um, I think one of the first things we need to realize is our loved one, our son or daughter, their partner is not the enemy. Mm -hmm. It's not the one that is, you know, pulling them away from God. It's, it's our it's our child's heart, and we need to see. This person is someone, their partner is someone that, that needs to know Christ as yeah, well. Um, so I would say, I think that it would be good to get to a place where um, we are able to invite mm -hmm. um, both, you know, our, our, our son or daughter uh, and their partner. I mean, because this person is important to our, our loved one. Um, where I would kind of make the distinction between truth and grace is... You know, I would say you're always welcome to come right. um, and, and even stay over both of you. I would just put you both in separate bedrooms, mm. you know, as I would if I had a daughter, a boyfriend, you know, came over. Mm. And, um, you know, that's just my, but they also, if they would like to stay elsewhere, you know, get a hotel, that's, that's okay too. Um, thank you for that. I know that's, these are, the, I, know, I realize some of the questions you're asking are nuanced and deep and personal, and it's hard to answer these pastorally and Mm -hmm. in a few moments, but here's one that's come up a number of times. Yes. If someone comes to your conclusion, uh, the conclusion you laid out in Holy Sexuality and the yes. Gospel and for us tonight, mm -hmm. 
Would you recommend for them divorce? What about their kids? Assuming they're talking about right, a same-sex couple here. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah I think the, uh, the important thing is uh, realizing that um, uh, marriage before the state is not no longer equivalent to marriage before God. Mm-hmm. And um, so there are a lot of things that are legal before the state that are not, are contrary to uh, the law of Christ. So I think that um, although they are married before the state, uh, they're not married before God. Hmm. And so though they may get a divorce before the state, it would never have been a divorce considered by God because Hmm. it was never a marriage before God. So that's that's what uh, Hmm. I think, because of course, uh, divorce is not something that that is pleasing to God. But um, this would never, this was not ever a marriage in God's eyes in the first place. This is one uh, from a parent, um, presumably. How can we support school age children who have a clear understanding of God's will for relationships, but consistently observe the opposite in their peers? Yeah, I think uh, when it comes to young children, and I think we, we always need to be very proactive in helping our younger kids. Um, you know, it, it's, it's in kindergarten now that, that teachers, I mean, and now there's pre-K, you know, and where teachers, they, they might not have a, a whole curriculum, um, you know, or a period or a section or a segment on sexuality, but they'll just be inserting it here. And that's, that's actually a part of the plan. Um, and, and they don't have to tell parents. So I think it's better earlier than later. Mm. And I think there's four important things that we our ch- children need to have a foundation of before we address the issue of sexuality. First is the concept of a sin nature. Mm. Not just sin, I mean, I, I, I'm guessing that a Christian parent is talking to the kids about sinful behavior. You know, obviously the most important one is obey your parents. <laughs> <laughs> you know, disobeying, disobedience is, is sin. But, but having them understand this concept of sin nature. So it's not just sinful behavior, but where does that come from? It comes from our sin nature, and that was not a choice. We had it as long as, it, as, as we remember. And that's where these, you know, the sinful behavior comes from. But the second thing we need to talk about are temptations. Because as we talk about sinful behavior, sometimes we don't talk about temptations, that being tempted is not sin. Giving in to temptation is sin. So we're not really equipping them to fight temptations. We're trying to equip our kids to don't sin, but not equipping them to that you will be tempted, not if, but yeah. when. So that's important. Sin nature, temptation. The third thing is then grace. Yeah. You know, so son, when you give in to sin, mm. God's grace is available to you. But that doesn't mean as, you know, the question that Paul asks is, we, should we just sin so that grace should abound, you know, in Romans 5? Of course not. You know, make anoint to it. Absolutely not. And that's where repentance comes in. So the four things, grace, I'm sorry, sin nature, temptation, which is not sin, but everyone's tempted, and then grace, which is available to all. And also, if God extends grace to us, we should extend grace to other people who, have, who are not following God and his ways yet. But we want them, we want to extend grace. And God extends grace for what? So that we would repent, put our faith in him and repent. You get that, parents? You just got a little, a short little lesson in biblical sanctification right there from Dr. Yuan. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, many, um, so many young people and teens believe it's okay to engage in, in a gay lifestyle. Mm. How can we help guide them towards the truth? As parents, I think you perhaps already answered this one, but. Yeah, yeah so I think uh, we need to see what is our ultimate goal. And I think it's important that um, it's always conversion before sanctification. Mm-hmm. In other words, um, we can't try to make people holy and then hope that they'll like somehow catch, catch on, you know, have a relationship with Christ. Um, you know, as, as you guys probably heard the metaphor, you don't clean up a fish, you know, and, and then bring it to Christ. You know, you just bring the fish unscaled, dirty, whatever, and just, you know, Jesus, you take it <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> because we can't do anything. Mm. So um, we point people to Christ. We pray that they will put their faith in Christ first because that's my story. Mm. I did not actually, it was, I put my faith in Christ sometime in the time that I was in prison. You know, it's quite different because in our family, my mother came to faith first and then my father and then me. Hers was a radical uh, like a, you know, instantaneous turnaround, you know, that 
on the road to Damascus. The scales fall off her eye. It was on one day. She could tell exactly she was on the train, ready to go kill herself. And God just radically saved her. May 13th, 1993. You know what I mean? I mean, had it down. For me. Let's all praise God for that date. Right? I mean, praise <laughs> the Lord. Right. Listen, exactly. Amen. You know, 180. Uh, for me. And I think the reason is because I'm just hard-headed, <laughs> much more hard-headed, and I was resisting God more, uh, but God's are irresistible grace. You can't re- keep resisting, and um, so it just took some time. I don't have a date. I, I never said a sinner's prayer. Like someone jokes me, you said, yeah. you know, never said a prayer. You're not <laughs> Christian then, you know, no. <laughs> but it's, it was just somewhere in that time that God broke me down, and, um, but it's... You know, it was faith in Christ, and then the Holy Spirit had to work in me mm-hmm. and convict me of, my, mm-hmm. of sin. Because how can I convict myself of sin? How could we convict our, you know, other people of sin? It's, it's Holy Spirit who does that. Um, uh, Pastor Brian, my predecessor who's on our staff, sitting right there, often says there are point-in-time Christians and there are process Christians. But <laughs> yes. we're still Christians, and I love that phrase. And I think we're talking about That's that. Great. This has come up a number of times, not surprised to see it. What do we do if we're invited to a gay marriage ceremony, mm. particularly if it's a family member or a child even? Yeah, I would say it's probably easier when it's maybe a, a friend or a distant relative, you know, someone far away where you could be like, you know, I can't, I'm busy. Um, when it is a loved one, mm. it can be really hard, especially when it's a parent and especially when the child is kind of make it, making it a make or break situation. If you don't go... That's the end of my relationship. Mm-hmm. You really need to pray and fast. Obviously, this marriage is not God's will. Being in a same-sex relationship or marriage is not God. It's, it's sin. So I would pray and fast about what God is calling you to do. You know, is my presence going to be uh, that I'm participate, participating or condoning this? I, need to, I would pray and fast about it um, with family, with, with your spouse, and if God is calling you to go, I'm suggesting don't tell your loved one over the phone, over text, or email. I would tell them in person. I would even like fly to them and tell them. Um, hmm. You know, the question is, is my presence condoning of weddings? I mean, if, when people go to weddings, does that automatically mean that you're okay and you're celebrating? In most cases, yes. Sometimes, no. I mean, for example, in-laws, right? I mean, not all the time are in-laws, you know, they're present, but that doesn't mean (laughs) that they're accepting. Um, However, you know, but I'm not saying so, therefore, it's okay to go. I'm just saying, thinking through this and thinking it through as well, biblically, when you look at the metaphor of marriage, you see actually from Genesis all the way through Revelation, marriage and weddings are a very significant um, concept. The Bible begins with a wedding. Genesis 2, the language there is covenantal language. So that's, that's like your first marriage covenant. Adam, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Um, the, the Bible ends with the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? The wedding supper of the Lamb in Revelation 20. And then all throughout Scripture, there's all these instances of, of, of wedding. And even the metaphor of marriage. In the Old Testament, Yahweh is the bridegroom to a really rebellious harlot Israel, rebellious wife of, of Israel and Judah. And then in the New Testament, we see where Jesus is the groom of his faithful bride, the church. So it's to, to make trivial this very important concept, I think, is something that we should not do. Now, this is what I think I would do, because I think sometimes we think, well, don't go or do go. What are my own? There's only, only two options. I think there could be more. I think that you could maybe be there for the wedding, but maybe not go to the, to the activities. Or you might not go to the ceremony. Like for, for myself, I would ha- have a hard time actually being present at the ceremony. Maybe you could be there for the reception. It's a free dinner. Why not? <laughs> um, I wouldn't be part of the you know, party. You know, because being part of the party is there condoning. I know Father says my, my daughter wants m- me to give her away to you know, her, her lover, her partner, her lesbian partner, and that's clearly a symbol of I'm blessing this marriage, and so, you know, I was just suggesting I wouldn't be a part of that, but you s- could still be present somehow, because, right, it's important about presence. Um, being at the reception, if you, if you decide to go, maybe, um, and being clear, because there's that many elements that maybe I just wouldn't be able to participate in. The toast to the couple, I wouldn't be able to... Um, uh, 
be part of that. You could, I could, you could do, you know, if they're toasting the individual, that's different. Um, I would not get them one single gift. Like going through the line, congratulations, I would say, instead of congratulations to the couple, I would say, I love you. I get, I'm so glad I get to be a part of your life. Get them not one gift, but two gifts, right? Because you want to bless and, and affirm the individuals, not necessarily the couple. Um, get them something, you could get them my book. God could use it. <laughs> you never know, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, you got right a miracle. I, I have a confession to make. I'm a note taker and you're saying so many things I want to write down, but I have to keep. <laughs> so, um, this is, a, this is a, a very personal one from someone. My brother is a gay man who had, uh, wants to talk to me often about his many love interests. Yeah. I want him to trust me yes. and to keep talking to me, but how do I loving, lovingly respond to this? Yeah, that's great. So, and, and I sometimes get a similar question where um, maybe like I work at Starbucks and my boss is gay or my a coworker is lesbian uh, and they come over and they talk about all their you know, weekends and have fun. So what do I say? Because everyone else is saying, oh, I'm so happy for you, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you know, l like this, you know, I'm right. so happy for you. That's what, that's maybe the usual response. But you can't say, uh, I don't agree with that, because then that, right, that would close down the conversation. And then, you know, and we, need, we need to realize listening does not mean accepting. That's important. How we respond, though, could say, I'm accepting or I'm not. I'm happy for you is a statement of affirmation. But what you can do is to keep the conversation going to affirm, right? We want to affirm the person, not what they're doing. There's a big difference. So what you can say, and these are lessons just from like pastoral, pastoral counseling. Instead of saying, I'm happy for you, you could say, I see you're happy. Or I see this person is important to you. Mm -hmm. You know, I see, just, just repeat what you see from that person. And that actually is a way to, in a sense, affirm the person and acknowledge their response without you affirming their behavior. That's good. Most of us don't think in, in the, that nuance, but it's helpful for us. Yeah, because it's, it is nuance where, and sometimes people might not even catch on. Like they might not really catch that, but like at least I, 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 I always want to know that my conscience is clear, that when I'm before God, that at least I can say, even though people might not have picked that, picked that up, the nuance, um, that I can say, you know, I can stand that, you know, I've, by my convictions. Yeah. This is a more academic question, but being a Bible professor, I think it's a good one for you. Is there a good resource that goes through the Bible verse by verse, unpacking context and explaining why same-sex relationships are condemned? So there are a few. Um, I would say Robert Gagnon, it was probably the, 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 the gold standard. Um, he, it, it's an enormous book. It's about that thick. It's called... The Bible and Homosexual Practice. And it's been out since, I don't know, 2007 or, I mean, it's been out for quite some time. So, uh, but there's a ca caveat. He, uh, PCUSA, and um, he does not actually hold to inerrancy, which is interesting. He actually holds to um, source cr criticism, et cetera, uh, JEDP, if you're familiar with any of that. But what's interesting is he uses all that to show that even if you hold to source criticism, that the Bible still condemns this. So it's, it's very interesting. Uh, it's very heady. If you want something lighter, um, I would suggest Kevin DeYoung wrote something, uh, what the Bible says about homosexuality, I think, or something like that. And that is more recent, and it's much shorter, maybe only about 100 or 120 pages. It's, it's much more readable, whereas the other is more like a, a, a resource that you would, and it's not something that you would just sit down and just read. But Kevin DeYoung is, is a good resource as well. Uh, are you familiar with Mark Yarhouse's work? Are you familiar? Is yeah. That, is that helpful as well? Would you uh, well, well he, he, would, he doesn't go through the, the yeah, different the passages as well, yeah. Yep. So these, the two books you just mentioned, we have a resource list we put together for some of our staff leaders. We'll make this available to you as well. If you should email uh, us, we'll be happy to share that with you. Um, this, is, this, this question's a little bit different, taking a different angle. It has to do with um, uh, gender identity, mm, and yes. which was not the subject of tonight, but I think it's worth mm -hmm. asking. Um, yeah. This person says, I'm a biological male who identifies as a female. Is there hope for someone like me? Mm. There's always hope in Christ. Mm -hmm. Always hope in Christ. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and here's the reality. Every one of us, we've been impacted by the imprint of the fall. 
even though our humanity has been distorted by the fall, um, we all have the image of God. We are created in the image of God. And that's quite amazing. Of all creatures, no other thing that was created, not even angels, isn't that amazing? Not even angels are created in the Imago Dei, and yet we are. And um, because of that, we have value and dignity. Uh, so there's always hope. Um, I would suggest, um, I know the struggle is real, that it, here's the thing with, with gender identity and transgenderism and gender dysphoria. Um, it's really not a struggle for what is male or female. The struggle is for what is real and true. The world is saying, what's real and true is what you think and what you feel. Mm. Scripture says, your heart, our hearts are deceitful above all else, Jeremiah 17, 9. Paul says in Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. So our minds, our hearts has been impacted by the fall. So at the end of the day, even though God has given us the capacity to think and the capacity to feel, I can't trust my thoughts. I can't trust my feelings. Mm -hmm. And as, even as strong as those desires or thoughts can be, um, submit them to Christ. And I know that's not easy. I would ask for, for people to, to, you know, have others walk with you. Um, here at Chapel Street, you know, a trusted friend, a trusted um, elder, deacon, pastor, uh, youth leader, and um, don't, don't do this journey alone. The enemy, you know one of his best weapons? Isolation. Mm -hmm. He wants you to think that no one will ever, ever understand. And unfortunately, because of that, what do we do? We get our answers from the world. And those answers have nothing to do with God. So there is hope, there's yeah. always hope. But put your identity, as the same thing with sexual identity, put your identity not in what you think or feel or desire, but put your identity in Christ. Why? Because we're all created in the image of God, but you know what, you know what scripture says? Jesus is not in the image of God. <laughs> it says that he is the image of God. And, um, that's what we strive for, to be more like Christ. Mm -hmm. So I, there's total, there's hope for you. And I mean, I would love to meet you. I'd love to talk with you and pray with you, but there's always hope in Christ. Mm -hmm. Put your hope and joy and life and everything in Christ. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I hope that this person heard that and will reach out. You quoted, he is the image of the invisible God. Yes, that That's amazing? in Colossians, which we're going to study. I was going to say, <laughs> yes. I was excited. <laughs> I was excited. I was Thank jumping you. inside. That. Thank I you. was jumping inside. <laughs> yes, <sir>. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we have time for one more. I know some of you submitted questions, but in the interest of time, to be respectful, we have time for one more. And this is, this is one that I think, um, I'm glad it came up. Can you love someone of the same sex mm. and still be a Christian? Mm. Could you be with them and still follow Jesus? Mm -hmm. Of course. Mm -hmm. God commands us to love everyone. Love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. Does not say, you know, it, it, love your neighbor, that could be someone of the same sex. Mm -hmm. Love your neighbor, could be someone of the opposite sex. Love your neighbor as yourself. But don't confuse love with marriage. Mm -hmm. That verse, love your neighbor as yourself, does not mean marry your neighbor. Yeah. Does not mean be sexually intimate with your neighbor. Actually, the two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength from Deuteronomy 6, has nothing to do with marriage, nothing to do with sex, nothing to do with romance. Second greatest commandment from Leviticus 19, 17, love your neighbor as yourself. That love, whether it's for your neighbor or for yourself, has nothing to do with marriage because you can't marry yourself, that'd be kind of weird. I mean, who knows, we'll maybe get going there someday. <laughs> but that love for your neighbor, nothing to do with marriage, 
nothing to do with sex. Mm -hmm. The two greatest commandments that Jesus gave, that that he pulled from the Old Testament, um, is the greatest commandments that are not grounded in marriage. So yes, love someone, Mm -hmm. love everyone. But marriage is not the same thing as love. And don't think that only love can occur in marriage. So marriage, on the other hand, is very specific. It's a very special, beautiful covenant. Marriage is not a right. Mm. The Bible never talks about rights. Actually, we have zero rights. Our only right is Christ. So, you know, I would say marriage is very specific. Jesus says between man and woman, husband and wife, uh, but that's not the only means Mm -hmm. to find contentment, Mm -hmm. joy. We must not forget our beautiful, perfect Savior Mm. was single, Mm. and he was perfect. Um, So, yes, there's you can be Christian. We should love everyone. But that doesn't mean love does not equal sex, you know. So, I mean, I, I'm thinking that the person yeah. is probably thinking, can I be in a right. romantic relationship? And that's yeah. different. Yeah, thank you. It's a good, perfect uh, note to end on. Our beautiful, perfect Savior was single and he was perfect and he's Amen. perfect for us. So let's say thank you once again to Dr. Yuan for his time. <laughs>